This is the second Lost Norwich video with commentary by Marianne Lake, recorded in 1981 with relevant pictures added. After I produced the first video, I received numerous comments from people who remembered Miss Lake. I'll tell you a bit more about this lady after she has brought us up to date with part two of her history of Norwich. The 17th century has that curious gash in the middle when there was civil war between the king and his parliament. Norwich sided with the parliamentarians and the crack maiden troop was recruited here. Actual fighting came no nearer than King's Lynn, but the cathedral was pillaged by fanatical Puritans. In 1648, there was a sudden upsurge of violence known as the Great Blow. A gunpowder store in Bethel Street blew up, by accident, it is said. It shattered windows in St. Stephen's and St. Peter Mancroft churches. Charles II was restored to the throne in 1660. Five years later, the bubonic plague attacked Norwich yet again. More than 2,000 people died. Only a glut of herring which was landed at Yarmouth averted the famine which threatened the survivors. Only six years later, there were already signs of returning prosperity. Export trade in Worcesters was developing again. Fifteen Yarmouth ships plied regularly between Norfolk and Scandinavia and Western Europe. The last chairman to ply for hire in Norwich stood in Opie Street. You could see such people emerging from their gracious town houses. Many of these remain in Princes Street, St Giles, Colgate, Tombland. BBC East occupies one of outstanding beauty with a graceful semicircular porch. These fine ladies and gentlemen went to the new assembly house built by Thomas Ivory in 1755. Or our elegant friends might have gone to the new theatre next door to the assembly house. This was built in 1758. The present Theatre Royal is the third on the site. But this was not just an age of frivolity. Thomas Ivory also built one of the most famous non-conformist churches in the country, the Octagon Chapel in Colgate. Norwich has bred many a pioneer. John Croom founded the only local school of painting of distinction in the country. At a time when there were few banks outside London, the most stable and long-lived proved to be Gurney's, now part of Barclays. And Thomas Bignold, wine merchant and banker, founded the Norwich Union Fire Insurance and Life Insurance Societies. Did you know that Burr Street was once called Blood and Gut Street because the slaughterhouse was at the south end and many butchers plied their trade here? The cattle market had to be enlarged. By 1800, brewing was big business. The water from chalky soil was good and Norfolk grew the best malting barley in the world. Some of the worst slums were in the streets where big houses had become tenements, with courts and yards built on erstwhile gardens, as in King Street, Magdalen Street, Burr Street. But in the midst of such appalling poverty and suffering, there were glimmers of light. In 1713, the Bethel Hospital for the Mentally Disturbed was founded. In 1771 came the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, with no drains, no piped water, no trained nurses, one resident doctor, no antiseptics, no anaesthetics, but progressive methods. Brewing became more important than ever. 
It employed a comparatively small number of men, but was probably the richest and most stable trade throughout the 19th century. The boot and shoe trade grew slowly and steadily. By 1935, it employed 12,000 people. In 1856, J.J. J. Coleman moved his milling business from Stoke Holy Cross to Carrow, whence the world was supplied with mustard and starch. In the 1860s, A.J. Cayley, a chemist, began to manufacture mineral waters in his cellar. Twenty years later, he began to produce cocoa, chocolate, crackers. Lawrence and Scott established the manufacture of electrical machinery. Bolton and Paul produced goods of timber, iron and steel. Much of this activity has been depicted on the bronze doors of the City Hall. The railways came during Queen Victoria's reign. By 1883, there were three stations, all outside the city walls. Thorpe Station, on open meadowland near the river. Victoria Station, on the site of the Ranelagh Pleasure Gardens, just outside St Stephen's Gate. And City Station, near Hayon Gate. What shall we say of the 20th century? We might consider royal visits, including those of Edward VII, George VI and Queen Elizabeth, now the Queen Mother, Elizabeth II. We might think of the Great Flood of 1912, of the opening of the Madamarket Theatre, of the completion of the great Roman Catholic Church of St John the Baptist, now a cathedral of the suffering and devastation caused by two world wars. But will you allow me to be quite personal in this last section? Where were the stores which used to be in St Benedict's? What had happened to Orford Place? The Boar's Head, the Corn Exchange, the Hippodrome, the Haymarket Picture House, the sights of all these had new occupants. I missed the clattering trams, the bullocks being driven through the busy streets on a Saturday to the old cattle market, the traffic in London Street. Perhaps the most glaring intruders were the red brick Anglia Square, the tower block in Wesselgate, so incongruous behind a medieval church and the little thatched house which I remembered as a greengrocer's. It had once been an inn, nicknamed the Barking Dicky, and the city hall with its tall tower. The new library was less obtrusive. I thought of Grapes Hill as a narrow thoroughfare, about four yards wide. But I marvel not at what has gone, but at how much remains. Walk down St Giles. You will find the church, the YMCA, the Salvation Army Citadel, 18th century houses and little shops, just as they used to be. Walk through London Street. Peer down Swan Lane. Salute the Scotsman, still on duty outside the tobacconist. Pass the bank which looks like a wren church. Come out opposite the church of St Michael at Plea, whose clock still says, forget me not, and emerge onto tomb land. There it is, as it has been for some two hundred years, with cobbles, church, elegant Georgian houses, gateways to the close. And there, Serene and dignified, the cathedral stands in its oasis of peace. I stand with my back to the red brick city hall, with its pillared portico and the tall clock tower, and I've almost forgiven it for dwarfing the medieval flint guild hall 
and the splendid church of St. Peter Mancroft. Beyond the market stalls, Davy Place and the Royal Arcade, I see the castle, square and solid on its ancient mound. And I thank God for the privilege of living in such a place, echoing the words of George Borrow, a fine old city, truly. On the screen now are some comments from people who remembered Miss Lake from the first video in this series. <laughs>